everyone gets a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Mike, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Pat, thank you so much for having me. My story really begins, like I think every good story does, at the beginning when I was a young child. My mom, who had me when she was 40, which is rare for 1961, uh, suffered from what they then called manic depression, what you and I know today as bipolar disorder. My dad left before I was born, and I distinctly remember growing up with my mom in a little two-bedroom two two apartment in central El Paso, where really chaos reigned. Uh, I distinctly remember as a young child setting out groceries in the winter because my mom would have forgotten to pay the electric bill and the electricity would be cut off. And it's then that I learned to eat cereal with water because the milk would spoil or the cats would get the milk. And to this day, I refused to have cereal with water. So if we're ever together and you ask me to have water with my cereal, I refuse to do so. The great thing about the story, though, is that my mom became very good friends with a lady and her husband who would eventually adopt me when I was went to live with them when I was six and adopted when I was nine, Jean and Herbie. And by the time I came along, Jean and Herbie, uh, who had been both married before, had ended up raising four kids. So I come along and I'm about six and my next oldest sibling is darn near probably 20 or 21. So I was the baby. And so I grew up in this loving household in El Paso. And I decide when I'm a sophomore in high school that I want to be a lawyer, as I think it would really be cool. So I set my sights on being a lawyer. And I graduate from UTEP. And I do, I'm fortunate enough to do really well at UTEP. And I get accepted to St. Mary's Law School in San Antonio. So I go down to St. Mary's. And I think I've got this. I mean, I graduated one of the top 10 seniors at UTEP. I obviously know how to study. I got this. And back then, and I don't think they do this much anymore, back then at St. Mary's, you got one exam a year, and it was your final exam. And you would turn in a postcard with your address on it, and in the back would say contracts or torts or consumer law. And then they would mail you your grade. And the grades generally didn't show up until the first part of February of the following year. So the report cards started trickling in, Pat, and let's just say it was not Mike's best performance. So I realized I had to recalibrate and do things differently. And I was fortunate enough uh, to end up graduating uh, high in my class at St. Mary's, went on to take a job with the Texas Supreme Court with a wonderful uh, justice by the name of Ted Z. Robertson. After that, I was fortunate enough to come here to Dallas with my young family and work at a law firm by the name of Coles and Thompson, probably one of the best civil defense firms in the state of Texas at that point. And I got to uh, work under a mentor by the name of Chuck Green, who was amazing. And I got to be very interested in transportation law. And so I left Coles and Thompson after about five years. And I was about a seven-year lawyer when I was working for a big insurance company and I got a call and they said, listen, we want you to represent this trucking company and it's a it's a minor accident, but we need you to handle it. And I said, sure. And so my point of contact at the trucking company was the director of claims, a guy we're going to call Sam. And so this is often the case in my side of the docket, little cases lead to bigger cases. And Sam liked the work that we were doing on his files. And Sam was a great client to have. He knew trucking and he would let us defend these cases. And he was very hands-on, which meant, and of course, this is all pre-pandemic, this is back in 1994, 1995, that he would come into town very often when there were key depositions or mediations, which meant he and I would go out to dinner quite a bit. And I got to know him and I got to know his family. And likewise, Pat, he got to know me and he got to know my family. He came out to our house in Waxahachie and broke bread at our table with my family. He was a fellow Catholic and he went to mass with my family. 
And I thought that Sam really had gone from being a client to a friend. And Sam was one of those guys that was so well known in the transportation industry. I, I, anybody who knew anything about the transportation industry either knew Sam or knew of Sam. And it was that generosity that I thought was behind a gift, a big box I got in my office in January of, I think January of 2001, was a huge box of Green Bay Packers memorabilia, signed football, signed prints, signed team jerseys, all stuff that he knew my young sons would love. And they did. And I called him and I said, hey, man, I really appreciate that. That's too kind. He goes, no, happy to do it. He goes, did you get what I sent you? And I said, no. I didn't see anything. He goes, well, look again. So I unpack everything from the box. And there at the bottom, Pat, is an envelope. And I open it up. And there are three checks in there. Three checks made payable to me, but not on cases that I worked, but for trucking companies for whom Sam directed claims. And I told him, Sam, there's been a mistake. These checks are made payable to me. And no one does that. And these are not cases I'm working on. He said, no, no, I meant to send them to you. I want you to deposit them in your firm's trust account. And I want you to keep 25% for you and give me 75%. And I said, Sam, I'm not going to do that. He said, well, the checks are made payable to you. So why don't you just do this? Cash the checks and give me the money. And I said, Sam, I'm not going to do that either. I, I even thought we were close enough. I said, do you need me to lend you $10,000? That's what the checks total. I said, no. And then his tone changed, Pat, from a guy that was very much a friend and congenial to pretty hard. And he said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to, ca- and this is the G-rated version, Pat. You're going to cash those checks and you're going to give me the money. And if you don't do it, I will tell everybody in the trucking industry that you have lost it. I will pull every bit of business I have from your firm, and I will tell everybody that I know who refers you business to pull their business. That'd be about $500,000 a year. So at that point, Pat, I'm at a crossroads. Do I cash the checks and give him the money, keep getting his business? Or do I call his boss and say, hey, listen, your director of claims is embezzling money. And you know, ethics, Pat, can get pretty darn weak when the reward for doing what is wrong or the fear of doing what is right is strong enough. So I cashed the checks and I gave him the money. And my life from that point would never be the same. That's the story in a nutshell. Well, you're leaving me hanging. What what happened next? So early 2002, uh, it's apparent to me that the FBI is in on Sam's scheme, and I walk away from the law firm that I founded. Came to find out that Sam had done this to the tune of about a million bucks with lawyers all over the country, many of whom were given checks in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, Pat, and many of whom would take the money, put it through their trust account, keep 25%, and give Sam 75%. So that January of 2002, I drove from Dallas to Waxahachie to tell my wife that I had ruined our lives. And even after 20 years, Pat, some conversations are still too raw to share. Let's just say that was not my best day. But my wife, who's not a lawyer, had the wherewithal to say, you need to get a lawyer. So we went up and saw a dear friend of mine in Dallas, Martin Lenore, who listened to me as I imploded and said I'd never practice again. He said, listen, I want you to go see the psychiatrist who's waiting on you. So Liz and I got in the car, still shell-shocked, went over there, and I ended up treating with this psychiatrist for over two years, and he would prescribe me medication for depression and anxiety. And then, of course, the state bar filed two grievances against me, one on behalf of my, my former law firm and one on behalf of Sam's employer. And this whole thing is going on, and at that point, In February of 2002, February 4th of 2002, the Bassett firm opened its doors. We had five people working for us. All of my clients except two had had walked away because I was radioactive. To fast forward, I ended up pleading guilty to one count in federal court and was sentenced to 90 days in a halfway house. My state bar grievance was heard, and the grievance committee months later issued a public reprimand, which means I would get to keep my license. 
So in January of 2003, I reported to a halfway house for 90 days. I could leave at six in the morning and I had to be back at six o'clock in the evening. Every time I got to work, I had to call them. Every time I left work for a hearing, a lunch, a deposition, I had to call them. Anytime I wanted to travel out of state, I had to get written permission to do so. And I learned in the halfway house, there's a lot of rules at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and most of them really suck. But I learned that if your sentence ends in a weekend, you get to go home the Friday before. So I believe it was April 13th, 2002, I pulled my pickup truck out of the halfway house for the last time and drove home to my wife. And that weekend, we had a celebration at our house. A lot of friends, family, people we worked with. And, you know, Pat, we had a big home and we were fortunate enough to do a lot of entertaining. But I got to tell you, that weekend, the grass was never greener and the hamburgers never tasted better and the laughter was just never sweeter. And since then, our firm has grown. Um, When we opened the firm, we had 162 files. I think this past week, we opened like case number 3,863. I still... Uh, practice law, do a lot of it, speak on around the country on trucking issues and, and on my story and on the boards of numerous legal organizations. And those things are all really well and good, Pat, don't get me wrong. But the thing I'm most important for and most thankful for is my time in the ditch and the lessons that it taught me. The ditch is such an apt description, I think, of of when we find ourselves in a difficult position. I think the thing that's so hard, that I find so difficult about your story is the fact that you caused your own situation. 100% self-inflicted. Oh, that hurts so much. It does. It's a, it's really a lot easier if you could blame somebody else, but it now, was all on me. Ultimately, we really can't blame anybody for anything. Ultimately, it's Ultimately. how we respond or handle a situation. But that's a hard lesson, I think, to learn. And I think it takes a lot of years for most of us to really grok that that idea. I agree. What are some of the m- more profound lessons that come out of this for you? Well, you know, I think I think to start, We all need to remember this, and I, and I will get to some of the lessons, but I think we all need to remember this. And this is a quote in my book by Brandon Manning, who says this, in a futile attempt to erase our past, we deprive the community of our healing gift. If we conceal our wounds out of fear and shame, our inner darkness can neither be illuminated nor become a light for others. And I think all of us have a story, Pat. Everybody has a story, some maybe not as dramatic as mine, probably most more dramatic than mine. And I think that when we go through these things and we process through them, and there's no way, there is no way out of the ditch, but through the ditch. And when we share our stories, I think we make the world a little bit better place. And I think one of the first things I learned, one of the most important lessons I learned is one of gratitude. Because let me tell you, every day could be a lot worse. And when we go through the day with a sense of gratitude or a sense of awe, I think it really colors our outlook in a positive way. And if we look for the good, it's amazing how often we will find the good. It's like when you buy a new car and all of a sudden you look around and everybody's driving the same car you are, that's because you're on the lookout for it. And when we are on the lookout for things for which to be grateful, I got to tell you, I think that's one of the things that can really change your life. I think gratitude is is a total game changer. Actually, I have I meditate every morning, and before I meditate, I find five things to be grateful for. And they have mm-hmm. to be different every day. I can't use the same five, um, but I often think that if we could look at our life, you know, as, as a as a timeline and a story, and go back and rewrite it from a perspective of gratitude, it would be a, a tremendous shift for most of us. It really would be. And it is, unfortunately for me, it's it's a conscious decision I have to make every day. During the pandemic, my wife and I got in because we were walking a lot. We were walking the dogs a lot because that's what everybody did. And we would, uh, we developed this sort of routine that on the way from the house all the way out to the turnaround point, we could bitch and moan about the day. But once you made the turn all the way back, you had to talk about things for which you were grateful. 
And let me tell you, walking back through the door, I always felt better when we sat and thought about and discussed the things for which we were grateful. You know, one of the things you mentioned is that when you hit a bump like this, it's that you have a binary decision, really, give up or get out. And I think that's very true. I mean, I, I always think you should look at the world in terms of gray, generate multiple options, et cetera. But there are times when it's like do or die. And I think that those moments can set the parameters for how we move forward. For example, the Buddhists always say, find the middle way. Well, mm-hmm. my my way of finding the middle way is I err err grossly on one side, then I err grossly on the other side. So my middle is is wherever it, wherever it falls. If I were a more temperate person, I might have a more benign middle, perhaps. I don't know. But um, I, I think that these life experiences that are out there on the fringes are – perhaps the most beneficial we will have. They are, the, I mean, these defining moments are like the ditch. And I hate to burst it, the bubble of your readers. The only true growth that we ever have in this world is through suffering. That's it. I mean, when things are going well, when you're just knocking it over the fence, when you hit every green light, when you close every deal, when you find money in your Levi's, when you pull them out of the dryer, those are all great things, but those don't help us grow, Pat. They don't. To radically change, I believe we have to be broken. Maybe not as severely as I was, or hopefully not as self-inflicted as I was, but I think that is where true growth comes from, is through suffering uh, and through getting through these things. And you talk about that binary choice. And I just have to say, I mean, I know it's, I think it's the end of Suicide Prevention Month. There were many times during my journey that I thought about taking my life. Because it was just not worth it. It was just the stigma, the shame, the guilt was just too much. And so anybody out there who's listening, I got to tell you, reach out to somebody. And if you know somebody that's hurting, just ask them one simple question. Are you doing okay? That's what helped me. I I think too often we fail to reach out to people. I, I think our sense of compassion uh, is not where it needs to be in society in general. And yet, I think you only develop compassion by going through hard times yourself. Oh, it made me, a, my ditch experience made me a much better lawyer, a better husband, a better father, and a better friend, because now I truly can empathize with the person who comes in my office and is worried about their legal problem. Because I have sat in that chair and had those fears, maybe not like theirs, but I've had those fears. And and when you talk about compassion, I don't know in your world, but I got to tell you in my world among lawyers, there are a lot of lawyers that get up every day, and I'm guilty of it as well, that put on a cloak of righteousness and think, you know what, I'm fighting the good fight and I am right and my client's cause is right. And the problem with that is when we put on that cloak of righteousness, I think it covers up one of our most important attributes, and that is the the attribute of compassion. And I just think of, you know, Nelson Mandela, who says, you know, resentment and holding all that in is like drinking poison to try to kill your enemy. It doesn't do anything but kill you. Yeah, the the Buddhists have one um, about anger. You will not be punished for your anger. You will be punished by your anger. Mm, That's true, because it will. I mean, it just it, it just makes you bitter. It makes you bitter and small and nothing really good comes out of it. Now, I'm all about you know, experiencing anger, I mean, that's a natural emotion. But like you said, are you just going to stay there? Is that where you're going to get your mail from now on? Is in that, <laughs> that big pit of anger? Or are you going to w- get through it? And I, behind me, you know, I've got a picture of uh, Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal. And it's something that really reminds me every day that we've just got to show compassion to those in our life world who are doing the best they can with what they have, with where they are. And on the topic of anger, I think that goes to re to shifting your perspective, because if you're angry, you're angry at something outside of yourself, typically, and that's going to get you absolutely nowhere. What you have to do is look at the situation and choose a response that is beneficial to you. And anger is not beneficial. No, it's not. And and you've got to start with forgiving yourself. And and I got to tell you, that was just such a huge, huge challenge and lesson for me and one I still deal with from time to time when this bubbles back up 
that I have to forgive myself and say, you know, I made a mistake. I've moved on. And if we can't, if we are not at peace with ourselves, and I call it doing the deep work, if we are not doing the deep work in our lives to see where we need to change and how we need to adapt, then I don't think we're ever in a position we can help anybody else. I totally agree. Um, but I, I think it's, as you were saying earlier, you do a deal, you get paid, you sell something, whatever it is you do for a living, you get this monetary you know, response. It's very Pavlovian, actually, in a lot of ways. You know, it's a monetary and materialistic response. Um, and yet the real satisfaction in life, I believe, comes from a lot of the things you're talking about, like gratitude, joy, finding true joy. That, that's another game changer. Yeah, because, you know, happiness and joy to me are two very, very different things. You know, people can be happy because, you know, the Dallas Cowboys won a football game. But to me, joy is transcendental. And that's really, I think, what we need to seek is joy. And my wife and I have this this saying, and I think I think we picked it up from Matthew Kelly, who's a, a Catholic writer. We will look at each other and say, you know what, this is just a perfect moment. And there are so many perfect moments in our day if we would just pause and think about them. And it really can be a game changer. No, I totally agree. What do you think is one of the most transcendental experiences you've had with joy? I can distinctly remember. um, We were fortunate enough, and in my book I talk about the Jesuits and what an impact they had on me after my flame out. We were fortunate enough to uh, make a pilgrimage with Father Joe Tetlow, a dear friend, following in the footsteps of St. Ignatius. And part of the part of the pilgrimage was to go to Rome. And we were in the church of, I think it's St. Peter. Is it St. Peter or St. Paul in chains? Any Catholic listener will correct me if I'm wrong. And we were there, and there was a statue of Mary. And I remember Father Joe saying, just take a minute, if you feel so inclined, and just think about your life. And I just remember this peace watching over me, and I thought, you know what? I, I am called because of my brokenness to be a light for other people. Not despite, but because of my brokenness. And that was just so freeing to me, Pat, because it was not something that I carried around that didn't belong to me, but it's just who I am. And that really was a game changer. That's one of the most peaceful moments I've had in a long time. What role did religion play? And when I think about religion, I think about the spiritual aspects as opposed Mm -hmm. to a particular religion, the belief in something greater than you um, Mm -hmm. and the possibility of surrender. What, where did that come into play? You know, it's funny, when I was raised, I was raised a twice-a-year Methodist, um, Christmas and Easter. And then when my wife and I got married, she was a cradle Catholic, and I had converted to Catholicism. And we practiced our faith, and we took our boys to, to church. We then went through Catholic schools. But I think what changed it for me was the ditch, because it strips you down to the studs, and it really makes you think, what am I about, and what is all of this about? And I think the one of the most spiritual things that that I took out of this whole thing was this concept of grace and just giving grace to other people and giving grace to yourself. And it makes the world, well, it makes our path lighter. We're not burdened down by a bunch of stuff. And w- when we give others grace, it, it's just so freeing to see what it does to them. And when we give ourselves grace, I think we end up as a better version of ourselves. Pat, I think that's one of the most important things that I took away from all this was just be easy. Just slow down a bit and give yourself a break. I remember distinctly, I remember distinctly watching this. My wife's father was dying. He was fortunate enough to die at home. And I remember sitting out in my in-law's sunroom and the bishop of El Paso, Father Mark Seitz, a dear friend, was talking to, he was talking to Liz. I was sitting at the table. He was not talking to me. And I remember him saying, just be easy on yourself. Just, it's okay. And that was one of the most important things that I have learned 
And when I do it well, and I don't say I do it well often, when I do it well, the the reaction and the transformation you see in other people is just undeniable, Pat. Well, I learning to forgive ourselves, learning to love ourselves is something that's really hard for most of us. Mm -hmm. And yet, until we at least attempt that path, we can't really be available for others because we go to our default situation, which is often judgmental. And, you know, I think of judgmental almost all, almost entirely when you look at people. Um, and that's not fair. You're really just projecting yourself onto those around you. Oh, yeah. I remember, you know, before my fall from grace, you know, I would read about the lawyer who had had a DWI or gotten sued or had problems with the law or was going through a messy divorce. And I would I would think in my mind, well, surely they're just not taking care of their stuff, because if you take care of your stuff and your work hard, you're going to inoculate yourself from life's punches to the face. And when a lawyer would have those ditch moments, I think they were just they're a loser. And I was judging people. I mean, I was putting them in in boxes. You're a loser and you're not a loser. But one of the most important lessons that I learned from my time in the ditch is that every one of us, Pat, every single one of us, I don't care where you were raised. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care your pedigree or your socioeconomic status. Every one of us is one left turn away from being in the ditch. And when you carry around that judgment, it just weighs you down. And And I get, I mean, we have to make snap decisions every day. And I get that. But when I find that I'm my best version of myself, now when I read about the lawyer who has fallen from grace, I think, oh my God, that could be me. I mean, but for the grace of God, go I. And it's just completely a new way to look at the world. And I'm ashamed to admit, I have to work at it every day. Because when I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, I can just be a miserable son of a bitch. But, but you're aware of it, and that makes all the difference. Um, and that, that's the work we I think we all have to do. You know, one of the things that's interesting, you say, you know, you do the right thing, you work hard, you know, you save, you you do whatever your whatever society tells you to do to be on the right path. And I think a lot of us really follow that path because that it's just drilled into us. And yet, I think it's an illusion. And I think that our sense of control, is also often an illusion. And that's one of the things I've really wrestled with, actually. Um, I find control to be a fascinating topic because I don't think it's real at all. No, I don't think it's real at all. And as, as from somebody who is a struggling, recovering control freak, I agree because you think, well, if I go to this college and I get this degree and I work hard, things are going to work out and doors will open up for me. And while there is some truth to hard work benefits you, there is simply no guarantee. You can do all the right things. I mean, mine was self-inflicted. But what about the young mother of three kids who gets stricken with cancer? What the hell? What the hell? I mean, she did everything right. And so I think this sense of control that we have, if we could just let go of that a lot, I think it would really help. And anybody who's listening to this who knows me is rolling their eyes because I'm one of the biggest control freaks there is. And I struggle with it every single day just to let stuff go. Just, you know what? Just let it go. And my wife has, my wife has a saying when I kind of get wound up, she goes in a month, is this going to make a difference? Really? Is it going to make a difference? And let it go. And that seems to help me a lot. Of course, I need a lot of adult supervision. <laughs> I think we all do. You know, it's interesting. Um, I had a, a situation that really shook me up vis-a-vis -vis control. Um, I, I used to fly high-performance sailplanes, and um, I kept my plane at Minden for many years, which is kind of a soaring mecca. You know, people mm -hmm. from all over the world come to this airport because of the flying conditions, and you can fly hundreds of miles. It's amazing. Um, and at any rate, there were two very well-known pilots, very famous pilots that were flying one day in a uh, a ship with two seats and all of a sudden they went into a spin and they the wings ripped off and they slammed it to the ground at 200 miles an hour it shook up everybody as you can imagine i mean mm. how can this happen and it was over in 10 seconds i mean it was boom done that incident really was a, a turning point for me in terms of examining control 
because there, before the grace of God, would go I. I've spun my plane in an, unintentionally. I, I was lucky enough to have things work out well. And actually, spinning can be fun under the right circumstances. Right. But um, it just made me really stop and question what is control. And then there's that fine line of you have to have an ego and be in control to do certain things, whether it's being court or fly a plane or whatever it is. And yet, at what point does that control become your enemy? Where, how do you balance it? You know, there's a term that, that I've picked up um, from my journey, and it's called various things. I call it benign indifference. I think that we, we can work for things and we can want things and we can prepare for things, but we have got to be okay with things not working out. And, and one of the ways that I've really seen it is we would, uh, let's say we interview a lawyer here that we really like, and we really want to get her on board here. And we interview, and we answer questions, and then we wait, and then you find out that she's decided to take a job somewhere else. And I got to tell you, that I used to get wrapped around the axle about that. It really would just frustrate me and upset me, and I think, what are we doing wrong? And, you know, what, what are we missing? And now on big things like that, I'm like, you know what? If it's going to work out, it's going to work out. And I know that sounds really, I don't know, pop culture-ish or maybe lazy, but there's just a lot of freedom in that, you know what? I did the best I could. I put it out there. I did the best I could. And if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And if it's not, there's something better. And you can never control somebody else. Never. Never. Ever. Ever. I don't know if you've ever read much Eckhart Tolle. I, I kind yes. of, I, I love him. Um, but I, I think, you know, the idea, his his book, The Power of Now, no. where you, you're intensely present, has so much wisdom in it. It's hard. I mean, you have to work at it day to day. But if you can have those moments of incredible clarity and presence, I think some of these things start to fall away. I think so. And I think that one of the things we have to do is, is we have to slow ourselves down. I have to slow myself down. I, you know, every year I'm, I take an eight or a 10 day silent retreat where I just go recalibrate. But you know, you can do it in the course of a day. Today, uh, this morning I left the gym and I, I had a very busy morning and I had a lot of thoughts jumbled up. So there's a Starbucks between the gym and the office. And I, I went inside and I got my coffee and I have my little notebook and I just wrote down one thing per page that I needed to do that was on my mind. And it took me less than 15 minutes. And I got to tell you, it just made the world a difference because I had stopped. I had put it all down, had a plan, and I moved on where there's a real tendency for me. And I think that I'm not the only one in this boat that the answer is harder work, longer hours, more grind. And oftentimes, that is exactly what is not called for, Pat, at all. Well, and all these thoughts just go around and around in our mind, and they're repetitive. They're not moving anything forward. And I think if you can take a break like that, it allows you to not only gather your thoughts, but to stop that monkey mind, if you will, which um, is something we, we all have to deal with. It is. And, of course, our society is set up that it just feeds on it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the iPhone, I don't, don't get me wrong. I love my iPhone, but I, I will tell you, that is just one of the most stress inducing things in my life. And I think a lot of other people's lives, everybody that's listening has been to a restaurant, seen four people around a table, every one of them on their iPhones. That just breaks my heart. Well, and it really, it erodes our sense of community. And I know community has been a really important piece of your journey. You've had rem people from work, people from, you know, your family who really stood by you through everything. You know, I think community is so important. And, and you know, there's that saying that African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go farther, go together. And I think it is so true. And when we are young and when we are on the, you know, the steep trajectory, we tend to think it's all on me. I'm going to, I'm going to be this and I'm going to build that. And and I'm going to create this and it will all be on me. And in doing so, I think we forget that none of us does this alone. And it's really not our doing. 
And this was so important to me because you learn, one of the things you learn when you flame out, describe it however you want, is you learn the people in your life that you can really count on. That doesn't mean they give you a free pass, Pat. I'm not saying that at all. But you learn the people you can count on. I mean, I remember a lawyer by the name of Jim Stanton, who before before my incredibly bad series of decisions, I'd known Jim for years. He and I had been were lawyers. We had been on the same side of cases. We had had coffee in various conference rooms around Dallas and around the state and depositions. But, you know, I don't think we'd ever broken bread. I don't think we'd ever gone to lunch. I don't even know where he lived. And yet, when I flamed out, he somehow got word and he calls me and says, hey, man, we need to meet. And this is a guy, Pat, that I knew professionally, but on a scale of one to 10 being one, a complete stranger, and 10 being my best friend, he was a four. I knew him. I don't even think I knew where he officed. And so we meet and he says, listen, you're going to need to get your feet on the ground. Why don't you come over and you can use my conference room at my law firm while you get your feet on the ground. And so I have all of my files brought from the old firm and myself and two other folks from my old firm sit around his conference table for a couple of weeks before we open the doors of our law firm. And who does that, Pat? I mean, who, who reaches out to somebody that they know professionally, not personally, they know professionally and it's only tangentially. I mean, that would be like you meeting a pilot at a conference once a year that you've seen four times over 20 years and reaching out to them and saying, listen, I've heard what has happened. This is what I want to do to help you. And that really proved to me the power of community and the impact that we can have on individual people's lives, not by doing great things, Pat, but by doing little things like, hey, man, come on over and you can use my conference room. And that really brought to light to me this sense of community, which is something that is so important uh, to me as a lawyer and a father and a husband, as I want to be surrounded by my community. If you could rewrite your story, would you? <laughs> no. 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 I don't think it could end up better than it did. Want to hear more of the conversation? Sign up at bumpintheroad.us as a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. You can give it a go for free. Just use the code FREEMONTH. And thank you for listening today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.